I want to welcome everyone to the Northeast Colorado Critical Business Updates for Business Owners. It's Bill Fulton with the Civic Canopy. We're um, going to get started in just a little bit, minute. But I want to let you know you're in the right place. We'll get all of our panelists and presenters lined up. Hello. Hi, Don. Glad the audio is working. I'm Lisa Hudson. I'm the director of the Small Business Development Center for East Colorado SBDC, and we're going to go ahead and get started. So welcome to Critical Business Updates for Business Owners. We're here every Friday at 3 o'clock, as are my dogs, and um, we're here to talk about the critical resource updates for business owners. Let's go ahead and go to that first slide. So this call is sponsored by Startup Colorado, the Office of Economic Development and International Trade the Department of Local Affairs, the Department of Labor and Employment, um, Galala Commons, Gross Seco, the Civic Canopy, SBDC at East Co and Southeast, and the Telluride Foundation. Um, so thank you all for so much for being here and let's go to that next slide. Okay, so for today's agenda, um, you're gonna go ahead and get a welcome by me. And we will be focusing on ag today. So we do have, um, CSU on the call, as well as the Farm Bureau, and then we're going to wrap it up with a QA. and a um, Before I get started, I just want you to know, um, with Zoom, as a small business owner, make sure that you're promoting your business anytime that you turn on your video. So right now, it looks like I'm in downtown Greeley. Um, this is a local small business behind me called Warm Hugs. And um, so if you are a small business, make sure that you're promoting yourself through that way. Um, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. And um, I just want to give a quick update, um, and we are opening the Q&A, so if you have questions anytime during um, today's presentations, make sure to use that Q&A chat box, and um, we will try to answer them live as they come in, and then we'll have um, an open Q&A session at the end. Now, I do want to announce that there has been a lapse in appropriations for EIDL and the Triple P. So if you did not get an application in, um, those will not be accepted until more dollars have been um, designated for those programs. If you have submitted your application um, successfully, you are in the queue. Um, really, the best thing you can do right now is wait to see if it's getting processed. You won't receive any information until it starts to get processed, and so you just have to be patient. There is a SBA 1-800 hotline that you can call to check on the status, but unfortunately, I think that they'll tell you the same thing 
just to be patient um, and they'll contact you when, when they've got news on your application. Now it is first come first serve. So if you're in the queue, that's the order in which those will be taken into consideration. So again, if you've got questions or comments, please make sure to use that um, chat box um, or the Q&A box and we will get to those as soon as we can. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, so I'd like to welcome um, Don Filmini from CSU. Um, Don is the Associate Director at the Office of Community and Economic Development and the Professor of Ag and Resource Economics. We're so glad to have you with us, Don. Um, I'm going to go ahead and turn off my video so people can focus on you. And um, let's start with that first slide. Thank you very much, and I appreciate that introduction. Um, I, I want to also give credit to the fact that Lots of what I'm presenting today is done with my great peers in the CSU Food Systems team and the Regional Economic Development Institute at Colorado State University. And um, as she said, we're gonna highlight a little bit of what we've been doing in the policy dimension that's been flavored by some of the applied research we do at Colorado State and talk a little bit more about how it relates to where we were trying to engage the state in discussions about um, how we make our, our ag sector more vibrant and resilient um, even before this event. So with that, let's go to the first slide. So in this talk, I'm gonna give you a quick overview of a, a little bit of policy analysis we put together quickly when COVID started, that even though it was focused on local, local and regional food systems here in Colorado, ended up having a little bit more of a spillover into USDA. We think thinking about um, the broader impacts of the, to the ag sector, um, almost based on the marketing channels that were being the most impacted. Um, talk a little bit about how that relates to what, um, how Colorado agriculture does look a little bit different than um, what's going on at the national level. Um, we thought it was a good time to take a chance to revisit the Colorado blueprint for food and agriculture that we had a chance to do in partnership with a set of partners, including the Department of Agriculture a couple of years ago, where we were even up in that region and. Um, had that region help us frame some priorities both for that region and for the broader state. Um, and then talk uh, at the end of the call a little bit about how we're seeing the policy response as it's playing out and what we might um, ask you to look towards keeping informed on and watching out for in the near future. So next slide. So these are two reports that we created, the first to the left, and this uh, is at the national level, and at the right is how we took some of the national numbers we estimated and boiled them down for the Colorado uh, ag sector. But again, this is a narrow part of the ag sector. Because of the work I do with local and regional food systems, um, uh, I was asked to weigh in on how those particular sets of producers might be impacted by this event, um, first at the national level, and then we translated again for Colorado. So when you see those, those numbers and those reports, which I don't expect you to read right now, realize that's for only a, a small handful of our producers. But what was interesting about it is as we framed those analyses, we decided to break the analysis down by the marketing channels that we saw being the most impacted. And from what we can tell, that actually ended up flavoring a broader set of how the relief um, looks like it was framed to come up with an estimated impact and how it likely will roll out to producers. So on the next slide, I can give you an example. Um, so for instance, one, one market channel we knew was impacted the most immediately and severely was restaurants and other institutional buyers like universities, hospitals, and quite honestly, K through 12 schools. Well, since um, when we provide technical assistance to a lot of producers who are having trouble being competitive in national commodity and global markets, one of the other um, business models that may work for them is more local and direct markets. You know, oftentimes we, these were channels they had built relationships in and actually had um, produced to specifically sell into. And now you're hearing the stories, the exact same case is true for big um, ag and food producers as well. So that's part of, again, how we came up with an estimated impact if we were trying to communicate to the government about what kind of, of, of of disruption this was causing that they might have to backfill on behalf of our producers. Um, so to make that point even clearer in the next slide, um, that was numbers that we estimated for Colorado, but on the next slide, um, we know that Colorado is far more than local foods. And if you look at this 
map the Colorado Department of Ag produces, there are a lot of cattle silhouettes on that. So we knew that that um, was also a market that was going to be majorly impacted. And just this week, one of our colleagues from Oklahoma State University put together the national numbers for that particular sector um, in the table that is shown here. Again, those are national numbers, but not Colorado. So even though we only looked at the smaller part of the puzzle, our colleagues and other land grants have been helping piece together more of the picture for more sectors, including um, beef. And I could have included dairy as, as well. And we have uh, colleagues at Cornell and Wisconsin working on that. So if you need more numbers, get a hold of me and I'll get those to you. Next slide. But again, um, the other thing we wanted to point out as a resource is we do have a Colorado blueprint for food and agriculture that if you Google, you can find fairly easily. This is something we had framed before this event. But the reason we think it's important is that um, the priorities that, that came to light from talking to the ag industry across the state are things we may wanna revisit now because we're trying to be optimist. And in addition to getting some relief secured for, for the industry, know that those monies coming in can be invested to make some strategic changes to operations that may take advantage of opportunities we already saw um, might be necessary. So it may be a good time to revisit that report and we'll talk about that a bit more later. And go ahead and hit the slide button a few times because there's part of the slide that doesn't populate unless you advance. And, and again, that blueprint was created from a data analysis of a value chain of Colorado Ag, a public attitude survey of Coloradans and their feelings about agriculture at our state, and a series of about 23 town halls we had across the state about three years ago. Next slide. So um, as an example of the value chain analysis that was presented in that report, which is about 200 pages, um, but we also gave you guys an executive summary if you wanna look at it, was what's going on with retail food in Colorado. Um, so we have about $33 billion flowing in an average year through our food sector. Um, of that, 31 is going through either food at home channels, and that's the retailers, of which the big five are the vast majority. Um, but then the other half of that or so is um, food away from home, which again is part of the reason I'm bringing up the importance of thinking about marketing channels when we look at this disruption um, on the ag sector is although it has a lot to do with what products are being bought differently, in our opinion, it has way more to do with what channels are being the most disrupted and their likely timeline for recovery. So this kind of shows you that whole picture. And again, that $14 billion industry had about 75% of its foot traffic go away in the, in the matter of 10 days. And although about 7.2 billion of that, or about half of that is more fast food, that can actually still function fairly well because of takeout windows and delivery. About half of that 7.2 billion is full service restaurants who if, if they're staying open at all and doing curbside um, delivery, it's, it's fairly minimal compared to where they were. So that's, that's one of the major disruptions um, we're looking at. Even though we've seen an uptick in those retailers, number one, it hasn't been enough to offset what we've seen as loss in the other channels. Um, plus as, as you've probably seen stories about we almost set up our supply chains and have it packaged and processed and labeled entirely different for those two channels. And we've never before in the history of our food supply chain since they started to be so dependent on food away from home had this big of a disruption to even know what, where we'll land by the end of this. Next slide. So um, this is actually a set of data that's put together by tracking cell phone traffic. It may, uh, give you a little bit of, of a haunting feeling, but they actually know where we are at all times. But this just shows you again in, in March, how precipitously the business dropped off for the restaurant sector. Um, so on the left-hand side is those sit down full service restaurants that um, you'd imagine being those steakhouses and Mexican restaurants that even if they're still open are doing minimal business compared to where they were at the start of this event. On the right-hand side, we've seen the counter service fast food sector hold up a little better because of their delivery and uh, uh, drive-through window options, but they've still seen precipitous drop in, in sales traffic. So again, this is why we, we know that the major disruption has happened in those institutional buying circles. Next slide. Um, to return to a discussion on that Colorado Blueprint for Food and Agriculture, we do want to point out that we visited your region while we were doing that process. This is the group that hosted us. Um, 
I don't have time to really go through that all, but if you actually go to that site, all of the regional opportunity reports are mapped out there. But for instance, um, even at that time, um, there was discussion about how important ag was to that sector and so that it was important to think about it both being well-functioning, efficient, and diverse. Um, um, and so it, it may be time to rethink after we find the landing place after this event about if there's ways to help pivot that both ag and food manufacturing sector in that region to be more resilient um, for events that may continue or come again in the future. Next slide. So to end my part of this conversation, though I, though I can answer questions in, in the box as well, um, what we're encouraged to see is that even though it's been a little bit slower to arrive, um, there, is, there is going to be relief coming to the broadest set of the ag sector that I've ever seen it mapped out for at least. Um, and, and what's encouraging again is that we've had a fairly bipartisan set of support um, to acknowledge that our sector has been impacted and that there is a wide swath of different enterprises that need to be supported and that the SBA and unemployment insurance programs aren't gonna be well suited to address. So this is a press release our two senators um, put out jointly this week that kind of um, shows you some of the buckets that you'd imagine there might be relief coming in the form of, all the way from livestock and dairy, um, um, as those are very big sectors in our state, to some of the small and mid-sized producers and especially crop producers who, um, whose models, again, were a little more dependent on particularly some of those institutional buyers that have dried up. And because their products may be more perishable, um, have not had the ability to pivot like we were seeing ag and livestock markets gradually do. Um, so it's, it's encouraging to know um, we're, we're like-minded in how the support should come to Colorado. And if you've probably also noticed that the governor and Commissioner Greenberg also put out a press release with some of these same themes, perhaps with the form coming in in a slightly different package through a block grant. But um, we hope, we'd hoped actually this might be announced by today so we could give you more information. But at bare minimum, I think we, we believe it will be next week. And again, if you, if you don't have a good relationship with your FSA office or um, someone within one of the USDA agencies, now's the time to either create that or strengthen that because they'll be your um, best uh, guide through that process when um, some port is announced. Next slide. So a, a small, small call to action for you all. Now is the time to very actively communicate your food system stories. Um, whether, whether it's making sure that um, um, your communities understand how pivotal a role that you play in their economy and their um, just healthy well-being, or as um, additional relief programs are framed for people to understand exactly the nuances, how this is impacting your communities and your sector is really important. Um, and this is an unprecedented event, so no one can tell you they honestly know where we're going to land at the end of this but it is definitely a time that if you're already trying to reposition your region or your community um, to be uh, innovating in a new space of the ag sector, this is going to be the time to do that because so much is gonna be potentially reframed, recreated and possibly restructured. Um, and so look for opportunities to create new linkages, including with your urban brethren. Um, they have a whole lot of mouths to feed, but not very much space to produce um, food and beverages. And so now is a time as they're thinking harder again about how these supply chain disruptions impact um, their security to think about how you can build better market opportunities directly with, with those people who are in our own backyard and uh, have, have buying power. We know there's gonna be an economic um, um, downturn here, but what we also know about agriculture and food is that it's counter cyclical and, and people are gonna keep spending on food. And in fact, there's some evidence they're spending relatively more time and money on food than they were in the past. So if that continues, it's a good opportunity for our industry to have them rethink how important you are to them. So with that, I'll turn it over to our next speaker. Thank you so much. I really appreciate all that information that you gave us. Um, I'm going to go ahead and give us a couple minutes. Um, if there's anyone who wants to type in a question for Dawn, um, and, and we'll be able to answer those. Um, I'll just wait about 30 more seconds. We do want to keep on track with the time. 
And I'm very responsive by email too. I have a unique name, so I'm easy to Google. So also if there's anything I mentioned quickly that you'd like me to share more with, I'm happy to respond after this event as well to any questions people have or getting them information they might want. Very good, thank you so much. Okay, um, well with that being said, let's go ahead and move on to our next speaker. Um, I'd like to introduce Sean Martini from the Farm Bureau. Um, Sean is the VP of Advocacy um, for the Farm Bureau, and we're going to talk about the industry and market volatility. Um, Sean, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to you. Sounds great. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. Just want to make sure that's coming through. Uh, well, great. Well, thank you for uh, the introduction and uh, to reach out to have us uh, come present to you today. There's certainly uh, a lot going on and uh, the name of the game is uncertainty. So it's it's good that you guys are providing this resource and happy to help do that. Um, uh, uh, my presentation and, and Don's will overlap uh, slightly, uh, but I think they, they build off each other pretty well. We had done this uh, once before earlier today. Um, so it's great to be um, in front of you all uh, this afternoon. Um, you know, I'd start out by saying, uh, you know, we well know agriculture is a critical business and it was designated as such by the governor, uh, Department of Agriculture and, and, and the federal government as well early on. Uh, but that doesn't mean that, uh, you know, it's business as usual uh, in farm country. We've all been doing, uh, following the guidelines uh, and trying to, to maintain uh, compliance with a lot of the suggestions that the state and the federal government put out to slow down the spread of COVID. Uh, and that's impact our, our daily lives in agriculture. Uh, but I want to uh, provide um, uh, some support for uh, the governor's team, uh, Governor Polis and uh, the team at Colorado Department of Agriculture for, for not only identifying that agriculture was uh, clearly a, uh, a critical business that needed to, to stay open uh, during this shutdown, but also for keeping uh, as much flexibility as possible in the executive orders that they've issued so that agriculture, farmers, ranchers, uh, agriculture processors, and businesses can continue to keep working uh, and keep their boots on and in the field uh, and on the ranch, but also that their suppliers and the rural small businesses that help support them uh, in doing what they do could continue to work as well. Uh, that is not the same kind of flexibility that we have heard from our Farm Bureau colleagues in a number of other states, particularly in the upper Midwest. Uh, those issues, uh, I'm sorry, those uh, executive orders that were issued were significantly more draconian and there's uh, a lot of producers that have been negatively impacted uh, and have a, a lack of ability to access the supplies uh, and products and inputs they need uh, to be able to uh, continue producing. And so it's it's nice that we have had not had those difficulties here. There's been uh, a few challenges with uh, vehicle permitting and driver's licenses and the like, but uh, by and large, it's, it's nowhere near um, the level of, of disruption that we've seen in other states. So, so that is good. Um, the, the, the carry on effects of, of COVID-19 and its impact on agriculture have been, um, I think most of the folks on this call realize it's been really devastating. Uh, and the problem uh, that sort of compounds on all of this is this comes after about a five years uh, downturn in commodity prices. In, in 2018, net farm income was half of what it was nationwide. Uh, five years previous. We had a little bump up uh, in 2019 and it was a little better year and 2020 was supposed to be uh, a lot better. We didn't have the weather challenges uh, over the winter and into the spring that we did in 2019. Uh, we we're looking for commodity prices to be a little bit better and boy, we sure, uh, we sure got slapped in the face uh, early in the year. Uh, and now we're uh, in agriculture are, are, are hurting uh, the same way a number of other industries are, are hurting in pretty much the entire economy. Um, the, the problems in agriculture are really stemming from supply and demand shocks uh, and supply chain issues. Uh, of course, consumer behavior is significantly changed as a result of uh, the statewide shutdown. Uh, just a few weeks ago, prior to uh, the, the statewide stay at home order, uh, you know, Americans bought uh, only about 48% of their food. Uh, the food dollar was spent at grocery stores. And now that is upwards of 90%. Uh, and that 
change is what is causing uh, the significant significant amount of, of supply chain trouble and now commodity price problems that we're seeing in agriculture. For the consumer, you know, empty shelves and the like, it's a little bit scary, uh, but it's not a supply problem, it's a demand problem and that people were buying up a lot more and people were changing where they were making those purchases uh, as a result of, of the stay at home policies. And that has really thrown our food supply chain uh, into significant disorder. And now a lot of the food producers, uh, fresh products like eggs and milk and dairy and, and cheese products and, and uh, protein, animal protein, beef and, and pork and, and chicken are, are having to deal with that shift, uh, a significant shift away from restaurant and institutional food service to retail. Uh, and that creates significant challenges. Uh, and particularly in the dairy sector uh, in Colorado, um, uh, in the dairy sector nationwide, uh, significant price problems, uh, and in a number of places because of the uh, the issues with supply chain uh, and the lag between where consumer demand is and the shift from from retail uh, or from uh, restaurant and away from school lunch, particularly for dairy, for fluid milk, uh, and to the grocery store has really caused problems. And a number of dairy producers in in some of our really dairy heavy states. Uh, are having to dump milk and it's extremely unfortunate. Uh, we've not had that here in Colorado as of yet. Of course, milk prices are, are uh, really in the dumps right now and that's uh, difficult enough on its own, but we haven't had to, to dump milk as of yet. And we're really keeping our fingers crossed that we won't have to. Part of our, uh, one of the good things that we have working for us in Colorado, uh, of course, is the Leprino plant. Um, outside of Greeley. Uh, that's a significant demand center for the milk, the fluid milk that we produce here in Colorado. And that's really been helpful in having in, in providing a, a, a real strong demand so that our producers don't have to dump uh, fresh fluid milk before it spoils and they still continue to have market access for that fluid milk. Uh, that's also playing itself out in the beef industry. Uh, of course, a, a significant amount of the dollar value from each beef carcass that we grow here in Colorado. It's our number one agricultural industry and responsible for uh, almost two billion uh, in economic growth. A uh, significant amount of that carcass value comes from high value cuts uh, at restaurants and, 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 and uh, food establishments. Uh, that is, as Don mentioned, pretty much entirely gone away. Uh, and now it's consumers uh, purchasing lower grade cuts at grocery stores at a much lower level for a much lower price. It's uh, uh, fast food uh, restaurants, as Don had mentioned, continuing uh, to, to use meat products, but definitely uh, at, at, a, at the lower end of the value chain. Uh, and that's caused significant problems in the beef market. There's uh, shortages now uh, on grocery shelves in the meat case. Uh, and that's starting to echo its way back up the chain all the way up to the producer. Uh, and now, unfortunately as well, we have the shutdown of JBS and Greeley, which is about 6% of the nation's beef supply. Uh, and of course, it's a huge demand center for the you know several million fed cattle uh, in and around uh, Weld County and all the way up through Northeast Colorado. Uh, and also for the cow-calf producers uh, that are around the state. Uh, so having that come off the line uh, however short term it may be, is going to have major ripple effects similar to what we saw when uh, the Holcomb plant in Kansas uh, shut down as a result of a fire. Uh, we were really concerned uh, and worked with Morgan County Commissioners and Department of Agriculture in Cargill to ensure that the plant in Fort Morgan did not also come offline as a result of employees being sick uh, and failing to report for work. Uh, the health department in Northeast Colorado has done a good job working with Cargill, we think, and uh, county commissioners in the state, uh, CDPHE, to ensure that that plant can, in fact, stay open, at least for the time being. Uh, that will really be helpful uh, in not adding just additional pain uh, and pressure on a segment of the industry that's really going through uh, remarkable volatility right now uh, and really damaging producers balance sheets now and, and going forward uh, all the way through uh, at least the end of the year. Uh, additionally, for Northeast Colorado, uh, impacts of, of this crisis and other crises at the geopolitical level 
uh, on the ethanol industry are going to be significant. Um, I've talked to many folks who work directly in the ethanol industry that really wonder if there's going to be an ethanol industry to speak of when we come out of the back of this. There's at least 8 billion gallons nationwide that have been taken offline currently. Most other plants, if they're not idled, are significantly slowing down their production. And of course, as we all know, that really ripples through local and regional supply chains uh, as those demand centers for uh, for field corn dry up uh, and distillers grains that come out the back of that plant dry up and, and cause problems for livestock producers who are feeding cattle and hogs and others who then don't have that source of feed and have to source it from somewhere else. Uh, of course, the, the uh, tax dollars and jobs that those types of plants create are also critical to our communities. Uh, and that, that goes for uh, Morgan County's largest employer in Cargill at the, the uh, packing plant in Fort Morgan as well. Uh, and so having those kinds of things shut down uh, is really scary uh, to a lot of our folks, particularly for the ethanol market. Of course, it's, it's a, a volumetric issue. People aren't driving as a result of stay at home orders. And so there's uh, less demand for that product on a geopolitical basis. You've got Russia and OPEC fighting each other uh, and flooding world markets with oil, driving oil prices down. Uh, into the 30s and lower. As a result, the wholesale price of gasoline right now, uh, uh, the gallon of gasoline is cheaper uh, than the same gallon of ethanol. And so really um, putting significant downward pressure uh, on the ethanol industry right now. And we're really concerned about where we go from here as it pertains to that industry uh, and all the other sectors uh, that rely on it and are, are tied to it. Um, from a, a good news standpoint, I would mention going forward, you know, we've never seen this kind of a, of a, a, a crisis before, right? Uh, and so our, our supply chains don't know what's happening uh, and people are, are working to try and shift those supply chains, as I mentioned before, uh, in order to, to keep product flowing uh, to where it needs to go. Uh, you know, futures markets don't know what's going to happen. We've never had this kind of a shock before. Uh, and so uncertainty is really the name of the game. We, we don't know where it's going to go from here. You know, Don mentioned typically agriculture and commodities do well uh, on a counter cyclical basis and they start to lead the way out. Uh, it was pointed out in a number of news outlets in Colorado the last couple of weeks. Uh, agriculture in rural Colorado really did lead the way out uh, of the Great Recession. Uh, just a few years ago. Um, and, and one would hope that that would happen again, but because of the unique nature of this kind of crisis, I, we don't know if it necessarily will. There's certainly a lot of headwinds for agricultural commodity prices specifically. Uh, but, but some of the tailwinds that we see mainly have to do with international trade and ensuring that we have access to markets that we've relied upon in the past. Uh, at the beginning part of the year, before all the shutdowns started to, to really take place uh, across uh, Asia uh, and then into North America and Europe, uh, we had really strong demand for beef exports. Uh, beef exports were up 10%, um, particularly to our largest Asian markets in Japan and Taiwan, Hong Kong and China, South Korea as well. Uh, of course, that started to drop off as they slowed down with their shutdowns. Uh, but that early demand uh, was a result of uh, a strong economy and people there really wanting our product. Uh, a lot of that is in the high value end of the market, um, uh, restaurant sales, so uh, high dollar steaks uh, and really premium cuts and premium grades. Uh, that adds a significant amount uh, of value to every carcass that we produce. Uh, and so being able to uh, to hopefully seek those markets again and have those come back online um, from where they're pretty much shut down now uh, is, is uh, going to be a, a significant help to the industry. Asia is sitting anywhere from uh, three to four weeks uh, ahead of us in terms of, of starting to claw their way back out of this crisis. So we anticipate that that demand will start to come back uh, quicker in those markets than they do here in the States. And particularly in Colorado, we're behind a number of other states in this country uh, as well. Uh, and so that, that, uh, those export markets, we anticipate coming back much sooner uh, than, than they will domestically. Um, we also have uh, purchases that we're anticipating coming from China, uh, both as a part of the phase one 
right, what they signed with the Trump administration and the, the commodities and agricultural products that they committed uh, through that deal to purchasing from the United States in the coming months. That is going to be um, to the extent that uh, you're gaming whether or not China will live up to those commitments. Uh, and that's still an open question. Um, one of the things that we have in our favor is, is uh, the shutdown of uh, the economy in China and a lot of the, the troubles that they've been having in agricultural production there associated with the movement of people and, and being able to get supplies and inputs. Um, they're going to need to make a lot of purchases, and it just so happens that they've committed to doing it from us. Uh, so to the extent that, that we can um, uh, be in an environment that is conducive to them holding up their end of the agreement, um, that's a plus. Um, again, it still remains to be seen. It's an open question. Uh, there are a number of other markets that they can go to and access right now, uh, particularly cheaper because the dollar uh, is relatively strong uh, as it pertains to a number of other currencies. And so that, that hurts our exports, but to the extent that they can uh, live up to at least part of that agreement, that will be a positive for, for um, the glut of commodities that we have in this country headed towards, headed towards China. And finally, USMCA, uh, US Canada Mexico trade agreement that replaced NAFTA uh, is been ratified by all three countries. Uh, both Canada and Mexico have completed the implementing legislation and regulatory changes that they needed to be com compliant with the agreement. The US is the last country to do so, but the USTR uh, and the president have both set July 1 as the target date for having final implementation. Even without final implementation, if that does not happen in July, it should happen by early fall. And frankly, having that certainty, particularly for the futures markets of, of duty-free access for American commodities and for Colorado in particular, uh, our number one export to Canada and Mexico both is beef. So having that access to the nation's uh, number one and number two agricultural importers in Canada and Mexico is going to be uh, extremely helpful for commodity prices going forward, at least into the latter part of the year. Um, the, with Don mentioned, and uh, of course it was mentioned on this call, uh, the stimulus with uh, PPP and EIVD, I keep forgetting the, the uh, acronym for the, the other major part of the program in the CARES Act. Um, of course, both of those, um, at least the PPP, is currently out of money. There were certainly challenges, uh, both for agricultural producers and, and rural small businesses and accessing those funds. There's also challenges for um, uh, local uh, and regional lending institutions and the bankers uh, that were dealing with the Small Business Administration. The way that legislation was put together, big gigantic pile of money, uh, and we had, you know, the Bank of Colorado trying to compete with um, compliance and setting up a program with the SBA and the, and the Treasury Department uh, alongside the likes of Wells Fargo and Chase. Uh, and it was a big free for all. So we're working with our banking partners, our financial institution partners and Congress as well, so that in um, the fourth tranche of stimulus here, uh, and the second tranche of, of the PPP program or, or whatever that program looks like going forward, uh, that there will be blocks of, of dollars available specifically to rural and small and regional banks uh, so that they have the ability to, to access dollars uh, without competing with the likes of, of some of the world's largest banks. And we think that will be really helpful in ensuring that both agriculture producers and our rural small businesses have access to that going forward. Um, of course, Treasury Department was uh, a little slow and SBA had never served uh, our kinds of clients, uh, particularly in production agriculture before. And, and that resulted in uh, you know, a fairly significant delay in some of those producers accessing those dollars. Uh, but of course, we also have the additional funding that was provided to USDA through the Commodity Corporation and others uh, out of the CARES Act. Uh, of course, that money is, we're still working with and waiting to hear from USDA, as Don mentioned, uh, uh, as to where that dollars uh, are going to go and how they're going to get out to agriculture producers specifically. Um, through relationships with FSA and, and, and the strong ties that our producers have with that uh, with that agency and with the USDA uh, writ large, 
those dollars will be a lot more, you can think of them as, as automatic. Uh, they will flow much easier to producers, similarly, uh, similar to uh, the way the trade adjustment assistance flowed to producers as a result of the wars. Of course, there will be additional purchases through Section 32 and the CCC to take up and, and soak up uh, over supply um, and um, supply pools for, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, for fresh vegetables, uh, fresh foods, and perishable foods, uh, as well as, as other commodities, uh, to, in order to help prop up prices and soak up some additional supply. So we anticipate that that will be, as Don mentioned, we were hoping we'd be able to share that today. We're working with the delegation and with folks at USDA to try and have an idea of what the shape of that is going to look like. And I just gave you the broad strokes. The specifics will will certainly come out. Uh, we're anticipating next week. We at least will hopefully hear from USDA and Secretary Purdue's office early in the week, uh, hopefully by Wednesday on, on what their sort of top line priorities are. Um, but this is always, uh, it's, it's frustrating that it's slower, um, but the, the specifics of where the money is going to go and how it's going to be distributed to producers is not something that Congress involved itself in. Uh, so it's all having to be done through a rulemaking process on the back end rather than have it soak up time uh, and have legislators arguing about it on the front end before the bill was passed. Uh, and so that's why we're sort of waiting. Uh, but USDA understands the urgency. We've been uh, banging on them quite a bit about uh, the need for speed with this. Uh, and we, we're um, looking at having them roll that out here in the next couple of days. So with that, Lisa, I can uh, take questions and turn it back to you. Thank you for, for having me. Thank you so much, Sean, and such great information that you've shared with us today. Um, we will go ahead and open it up to Q&A. Um, if you've got a question, go ahead and type it in that Q&A box. I'm just going to go through some that we have received in that box, um, and we did answer um, via text during the session. Um, one question was relevant to the Unemployment and CARES Act. Um, and what we're recommending is if you have got questions about unemployment in the CARES Act, there is going to be um, a webinar on Monday um, and the CLDE is hosting that. So um, in the Q&A box, you can see the answer. There's a link for that webinar that's coming up here on Monday and we would highly encourage that you register for that. Um, just some other comments that were in the Q&A about great information. Um, so thank you again, Sean and um, to Don for both of your presentations, um, extremely informative. Um, one person had mentioned um, identifying ways um, to consider what new and emerging partnerships may be needed to navigate the unique nature of the crisis. And I just want to add a note and say, if, if you were able to attend Senator Bennett's um, webinar earlier today is we're all trying to adjust to this new normal and whatever that is in the time between now and when we get to that new normal. And so I think um, the important thing is to really support each other and um, just continue to build those partnerships, um, which actually leads me to our next piece. Um, actually, we've got one question here that just came in. It says, will the current level of disruption in the calf cattle markets reverberate over the long term in both producer and wholesale markets for months or years going forward? This question I would believe is directed to you, Sean. Oh boy. Um, boy, at least months, I would say, if not years. I'm, I'm not a, uh, an economist specific to uh, the beef industry by any means, but all the smart uh, economists and folks I get to talk to all the time are, are looking for this to, to really be felt uh, at least through you know, 2021. Uh, in some form or fashion, of course, the uh, the current dislocation that we're seeing as a result of plant closures, that's that's obviously in the intermediate term, but can also additionally um, find its way uh, down through through the course of the year. Uh, but I think, you know, we're, we're going to be seeing knock on effects from this in some form or fashion and in ways that we cannot now predict, um, at least through through 2021. Great, thank you. All right, I'm not seeing any other questions come through. Um, let's go ahead and review some resources that we have um, on the slide. We do have the presentation available on the East Colorado SBDC website. Uh, let's go back to just one more slide. Thank you. Um, for more business resources in English and Spanish, you can visit coloradosbdc.org slash COVID. 
And um, for resources related to entrepreneurs and entrepreneurial communities, go up, go to startupcolorado.org. And I'd also like to plug that Startup Colorado um, has an amazing podcast that you can follow. So I would check that out if I were you. Um, go ahead and go to the next slide, please. Okay, um, so I do want to reference that there are some um, alternative funding models available, and the state has put together this fantastic document. It's on Google Drive, um, so that way they can update it more easily, and it is constantly getting updated. Um, one thing that I'd like to point out that is on this alternative funding, um, an example, is um, that one of the funding resources on the list is Greenline Ventures. Um, who just launched an emergency microloan fund to provide much needed funds to minority women or veteran owned small businesses across Colorado that have been economically impacted by the pandemic. Loan amounts will range from 5,000 to 25,000 and interest rates will be fixed at 2% following an initial six months, no interest period. Um, the link to the application can be found on that alternative funding list. Um, one other that I saw on there and that was promoted by the Yuma um, Chamber of Commerce was the Save Small Business Fund. So this is something that was put together by the US Chamber of Commerce Foundation. It looks really interesting. It's for um, small businesses with an employee count of three to 20 employees. And it's up to $5,000. And that application will open on the 20th of April. So these are just some examples of um, different programs you can find at that alternative funding Google Doc. Um, and we've got that in this presentation, as well as on the East Colorado SBDC.com website. Um, so you can go ahead and go there and find that. And um, some other things that we found um, really helpful is the Greeley Area Recovery Fund was just launched today. The application went live at noon. And um, this is a really cool program that the city of Greeley, the city of Evans, and the Greeley Area Chamber of Commerce put together to support small businesses in Greeley and the surrounding communities. Um, so like I said, that application went live today, um, and I think that it's a $5,000 grant um, as well. Um, so you can go to the Greeley Area Recovery Fund and complete that application um, and also see if you are eligible for it. Uh, let's see, the Colorado COVID Relief Fund um, is available for nonprofit and for-profit. Um, there's just a simple five question application and that's up to $25,000. Um, another local program for Phillips County, um, resources and funding are available at phillipscountyco.org. Um, and I've noticed um, that there's been several um, counties, including Phillips, Sedgwick, Washington, Kit Carson, Morgan, and Yuma County, um, as well as Logan, that have developed a business tracker. And it's a fantastic way to see what's going on in your county um, with your small businesses relative to COVID. Um, so we'll go ahead and share that link. Um, I'll share the one to Logan in the chat box and that way you can see it. Okay, so you should be able to see that in the chat box. Um, let's see, they had, um, yeah, so those are just some um, great resources that we have. Um, we'll go ahead and go to the next slide, please. Okay, um, this is something that we had touched on that'll be on um, Monday. So the unemployment webinar, um, the Colorado Department of Labor and Unemployment Town Hall is set for Monday. Um, we encourage callers needing information about unemployment benefits to register for the event. Um, it'll be on Monday at 9.30. Um, the last few weeks that we've held this call, we've gotten several questions about this. So I really hope that you'll be able to get those um, questions answered here. Um, we will have the English registration form is on your slide here, as well as a registration in Spanish. So if you'd like to access that, it's right there for you. Next slide. Um, that's all that we have for today. Um, next week on Friday at 3 p.m., we are going to be focusing on resources for hemp farmers. Um, as you may know, the East Colorado SBDC has um, taken an initiative to support hemp farming throughout the state of Colorado. And so we're bringing resources together to um, provide information to hemp farmers on what's available. Um, and we are here every Friday at three o'clock and we hope to see you next Friday. If you've got any ideas on topics that you'd like to know more about, please reach out to us. Um, you can 
contact the East Colorado SBDC and we'll get that set up. Um, just email us at info at eastcoloradosbdc.com and have a great weekend and thanks for coming today.